Since today's date is 420, let's talk about weed. Recreational marijuana is now legal in 21 states and decriminalized in 10 additional states. That means more of our surgical patients are using marijuana in their free time and are coming to us with chronic and sometimes even acute use of marijuana. One of the hardest parts about this is that marijuana remains a schedule one drug on the federal list. So there's not much research about how it interacts with other drugs. So all we really have for research out there is case reports talking about how patients present. Let's talk a little bit about the pharmaco properties of marijuana. So cannabis uh, works on cannabinoid receptors known as CB1 and CB2 receptors which are found all throughout the body. The psychoactive property of weed is going to be Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol otherwise known as THC. It's difficult for us to really assess the pharmacodynamics of THC mainly because different products that people use have different percentages of how much THC is in that products. There's also different ways that people can ingest marijuana, whether they're smoking it or they're eating it. Smoking it, you can have results within seconds to minutes, whereas if someone's ingesting it orally, usually that can be delayed about one to two hours. These active compounds typically first start off in the vessel rich groups, so they first affect the heart, the brain, and then they move to the muscles and then eventually use move to the fat. In the fat is where THC can be stored for long periods of time, some places say up to 30 days. This typically depends on how much people are smoking and for how long they've been smoking for. Uh, but in terms of the half-life in the plasma, THC usually lasts about uh, 20 to 30 hours. So let's quickly talk about how marijuana can affect your central nervous system, your cardiac system, your pulmonary system, and your GI system. When you use marijuana acutely in the central nervous system, you can see anxiolysis or decreased anxiety, but you can also see paranoia as well as psychosis. Um, you can also have headaches as well as dizziness. Patients may also have issues with memory. When patients use it chronically in the CNS, you can develop tolerance and then need a higher dose every time you use it to get the same effects. For the cardiovascular system, when patients use marijuana acutely, you can have tachycardia, vasodilation, and orthostatic hypotension. When patients smoke weed chronically, this typically can develop uh, atherosclerosis or a buildup of plaque within the arteries. For the pulmonary systems, when we see patients using marijuana, you can actually see bronchodilation. However, you also have an increased reactivity to your bronchial airways, as well as increased uh, airway edema. Chronic smoking obviously causes emphysema, which can lead to COPD. And in the GI system, acute use can lead to decrease in nausea, as well as increased appetite. However, chronic use of marijuana has shown to lead to hyperemesis, or really nasty vomiting over and over again. And I've seen patients come into the ER for this. So for anesthetic consideration, let's break it down into preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative considerations. Preoperatively, you may have to deal with the anxiety, the paranoia, or the psychosis that patients are going through if they've ingested it recently. Uh, if they also are acutely intoxicated, this also becomes an issue with consent, making sure that the patient is aware of what's going on around them. You may consider having a family member consent for the surgical procedure or the anesthesia that they're getting. You're also going to want to evaluate how often they smoke, how much do they smoke, and if they use any other drugs. Lastly, there's evidence to support that patients who smoke and then have to go into surgery have an increased risk for an MI within the first hour of them ingesting marijuana. Interoperatively, there's research to show that these patients will need a higher dose of induction agents, so like a higher dose of propofol to go to sleep. There's also evidence to show that they have a higher bispectral index, so if you're using a biz monitor, you may not have a reliable uh, reading on there to know how aware they are or how awake their brain activity is. You'll also want to take into the fact that their airway is going to be more hypersensitive or hyperreactive, and we also don't really know what the cross-reactivity is to our other anesthetic drugs. Postoperatively, again, we don't know all the cross-reactivity that happens with different analgesics, and these patients typically have a higher pain perception, so they may require higher doses of pain medications in the PACU. The other thing you're gonna to wanna to look out for is withdrawal symptoms for patients who are really big chronic smokers who then get that taken away from them because they're in a hospital setting. Symptoms of withdrawal are gonna be insomnia, irritability, anxiety, uh, things like that. And for anyone out there who uses marijuana or smokes weed, it's really important to tell your healthcare provider that you do. It's not because we wanna get you in trouble, it's just because we wanna take the best possible care for you. And it does impact how we provide anesthesia and how we keep you safe during surgery.